All right, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, so, of course, uh, reading by the uh, key is up there, section 3.1 to 3.8. Uh, uh, and of course, we have the uh, written exam number one coming up on Thursday, the whole class period. Uh, when we last left off, we talked about uh, the short term scheduler. And this is a scheduler uh, that selects uh, processes uh, that are going to execute on the CPU. Uh, we also uh, talked about the long term scheduler uh, that uh, selects which processes are brought into the ready queue. And so it's a long term scheduler's job to determine the uh, so called degree of multi programming. Uh, the more processes you have, the more share the machine is. And you can think of degree of multi-programming as the degree of sharing. If there are more quote unquote mouths to feed, so to speak, uh, your degree of multi-programming uh, is higher. And so let's continue on and we'll talk about uh, processes in general. Now typically uh, when you categorize or describe processes, uh, there are two uh, major flavors that they talk about, a so-called I.O. bound process and a so-called compute bound uh, process. And so a compute bound process is one uh, that spends a lot of time uh, using up primary operations on the CPU. Uh, things like calculating numerical quantities, uh, things like doing arithmetic, a lot of logical operations and so forth. Uh, and I.O. bound process uh, is contrasted with a CPU or compute bound process in that I.O. bound process uh, touches a lot of I.O. devices. And so it's going to maybe write to disk a lot. Maybe it's going to do a lot of display. Maybe it's going to interact with the network card, both uh, pulling data off the network as well as pushing data onto the network. And so um, if you are I.O. bound, of course, uh, the bus bandwidth is going to be really important. Also, what's going to be important is uh, the I.O. controller and things like the direct memory access. Because if your uh, I.O. device can very rapidly uh, get information uh, from the piece of memory for the I.O. controller into uh, main memory, i.e. RAM, very quickly, uh, then the performance of your I.O. is going to be quite fast. And so um, otherwise, an I.O. bound process is more likely uh, to execute system calls uh, that will cause it to wait, because a lot of system calls pertaining to I.O. device interaction uh, causes you to be removed from the CPU and put on the wait queue uh, associated with those uh, I.O. Device, the devices. And so the long-term scheduler uh, strives to have a good mix of these types of processes, the I.O. bound and compute bound. Uh, compute bound makes a lot of use of the fractional time uh, for the CPU, whereas I.O. bound, uh, they're going to be waiting a lot. And so if you have a general purpose machine, and you have the majority of your processes as I.O. bound, you're not going to realize very good throughput, and you're not going to make efficient use of all the hardware. Likewise, if you have uh, a work set on a computer that is primarily CPU bound processes, um, you're going to be using a lot of the CPU, but uh, the I.O. is going to be relatively idle. And moreover, if you have a lot of use of the CPU, of course, you're going to realize a slowdown if everyone on the system is buying for fractional use of the CPU's time. And so the long-term scheduler tries to have a good mix of these in order to keep as many parts of your machine going, making efficient use uh, as it can of the parts of your system. Uh, any questions about this? Make sense? Okay, uh, so uh, there's another scheduler called the medium term scheduler. And these are just general terms. Not every operating system implements all of these things. Uh, for some operating systems, it's just a short term scheduler for everything, and that's it, right? Uh, but the medium term scheduler uh, is added uh, if you want your multi programming needs to decrease. And what does that mean? Well, multi programming uh, refers to the number of processes or programs in execution that are in memory in the system in uh, some form. Now when I say some form, I mean they could be ready to run, i.e. at any moment's notice, uh, they can be put onto the CPU, the process control block for that process's context is copied onto the CPU's registers and other parts of the system. Uh, and then that uh, process is given the CPU's time for some amount of depth of T. Uh, now, um, what this multi-programming refers to for the medium term scheduler is that some processes, as I alluded to very early in the course, uh, parts of it can be taken out of memory and can be put onto a special part of your disk. And the special part of your disk is called the backing store. And so the medium scheduler's, uh, medium term scheduler's job is to either decrease multi-programming or increase multi-programming by pushing uh, processes 
uh, onto their on disk format in that special region of disk called the backing store. And that process is called swapping, right? And so when you swap a process onto the CPU or onto the system, it's taking that PCB information uh, and reading it off of a special location in disk and then putting it into uh, the ready queue, right? In in-memory form. And then swapping out a process means that you're doing the dual operation. You're taking that process from its in-memory format, uh, taking the PCB information and writing it out to that special region of disk uh, called the backing store. Uh, so the medium term scheduler, uh, it can add a degree of multi-programming, can increase or decrease it, and it physically removes processes from memory, either storing them on disk or bringing them back from disk. If you can store a data structure in memory, you can absolutely uh, write that data structure out of the disk. And as we said uh, earlier uh, in the semester, is that your hard drive can store much more information than RAM, but the cost of that is that your hard drive is slower uh, than RAM. Now certainly with things like um, SSD uh, drives uh, that are all in silicon, it's faster, but your hard drive is still slower than the actual RAM itself. And of course the fastest memory on your system are those registers uh, on the CPU, right? And so because it's so much larger, now you can give the illusion through this medium term scheduler uh, that more programs fit on your system than you have physical available RAM. Uh, and so, let's say you have uh, a 500 gig or one terabyte hard drive, uh, and you set up when you install the operating system. Uh, if you've ever installed Linux, it'll ask you if you do the partition yourself, how big do you want your swap partition to be? And your swap partition is that part of disk that's set aside uh, for storing the on disk format of the PCBs, the process control blocks. And so, um, the rule of thumb. Is generally a two to one. Uh, so if you have, say, you know, um, you know, 10 uh, gig of RAM, you'd have a 20 gig swap space. And once your RAM gets really large, it goes to one to one. And so if you've ever set up or installed, you can try it yourself, don't believe me. Um, try to install Linux, uh, Ubuntu Linux, or any Linux uh, where you set up the partition yourself. One of the things you'd be asked is how big your swap partition should be. And so the swap partition is nothing more than a segment or part of your hard drive that is set up and formatted to store uh, the on-disk format uh, for these PCDs. So here we have, let's start out in the ready queue. And let's say you know you double clicked on an icon, or you went to the command line, you typed the name of the program, hit enter, it's now loaded from disk, and it's a process. And it sits in the ready queue, uh, it's PCB, or pointer to its PCB, which is a struct, as we had talked about before, and it's scheduled for execution on the CPU. Uh, now, a number of things can happen. Um, let's say that process terminates. You call exit on your program, and it just terminates normally all those resources uh, that it was accumulating over time, whether that's memory, files, and so forth, uh, get restored uh, back to the system, available for use by the processes by the operating system. So you exit your program, it's running, so you're on the CPU executing, and you decide to, you know, the program's done, it exits, it now ends, those resources are reclaimed. Another thing that could happen, let's say, you know, you're writing a network program, and your program decides to, uh, Send data over the network card just waiting for a response. So you're interacting uh, with the I.O. subsystem, specifically uh, the network uh, card. And so it pauses for I.O., so you're booted off the processor because that's an operation that requires your process to wait. And so you go into uh, the ready queue uh, for, uh, uh, rather the wait queue, for this I.O. device for the network card. Uh, and you're now waiting uh, in that wait queue for the device. And once that device wakes up, the network card and it has actual data in its uh, controller's buffer, uh, you're now uh, in your ready to run again state. So you get your IO operation serviced, and then you're put back into the ready queue so you can be scheduled for execution on the CPU. Okay. Uh, so the other thing that can happen is what happens when you have exhausted your unit of time on the CPU? Well, uh, you get swapped out. Uh, if there's not enough memory uh, to store you uh, in RAM. So the degree of multi-programming, let's say, you know, you could try this yourself, you had about maybe 20 applications, and not even 20, uh, and you just started running them one at a time. Another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, and started using them. At some point, you're gonna see uh, your performance start to really degrade. 
And if you bring up the performance meter, uh, whether it's Windows uh, or Mac OS, uh, you're also going to see that the disk drive is going to become a lot more active. Now, the disk drive becoming a lot more active means that your medium term scheduler is starting to swap processes off into the backing stores, writing these PCBs uh, out on a special region of disk because there are too many programs uh, to support efficient operation. The degree of multi program is too high, and the medium term scheduler is trying to reduce that by offloading some of these programs momentarily. And so, in that particular case, you're running on the CPU. Uh, and you get swapped out. Now, if you get swapped out, certainly um, you're partially executing. Uh, you're frozen in time. Your PCB information is written out to disk. And then at some point, you get swapped back in. The medium term scheduler decides, hey, well, you've been waiting on disk in some form uh, for too long. Let's pull you back in so you can now execute for a little bit. So uh, the medium term scheduler, you get swapped back in. So the on disk format of your process control block uh, gets right off the disk, put back into memory, and now you're placed in the ready queue so you can be scheduled for execution uh, by the short term schedule. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Let me do a time check here. My daughter's cat watch. Yeah. All right. So let's look at multitasking in mobile systems. Now, certainly, when we talk about the long-term scheduler, the short-term scheduler, and the medium-term scheduler, that's all very general. But certainly, if the platform changes, i.e. the resource set changes upon which your operating system runs, uh, you're going to have to change the way uh, these, the scheduling works. Now, of course, in mobile systems, you don't have as much battery power. And why does that matter? Well, uh, it matters because when you have all the parts of your system running, uh, that's a very power um, expensive operation. And so you'll notice sometimes um, when you have your laptop running off a battery and you're trying to do something like you know, transfer something across the network, it's much slower. And the reason for that is when you're running off a battery, uh, your system is trying to preserve battery life because uh, preserve battery life or energy efficiency means that you can run for a much longer period of time. And so it'll literally shut off parts of your system uh, that it thinks um, aren't necessary for the task at hand that's running on your, uh, uh, associated with your processes. And so when you have mobile systems, uh, the way they do scheduling changes because the resource set, things like battery, uh, is reduced. Moreover, uh, the power of the CPU, the amount of computational horsepower is also much less when you have a mobile system. In addition, uh, many mobile systems uh, often have wireless communication. And communication is the single most power hungry function uh, on your uh, system. Right? Uh, it takes a lot of energy uh, to power up the head antenna and to send electromagnetic uh, waves or radio waves uh, to some other antenna. And of course, certainly, the further you are away from the antenna, the more power uh, it needs. If you've ever had a situation where maybe you're driving on a road trip in some you know, rural area, you find your cell phone heats up a lot, and that's because it's boosting the power because it's further away from the cell phone. And so, this idea of things changing in mobile systems uh, it also impacts the, uh, the operating system design. And so some mobile systems um, only allow only one process to run at a time. And early versions of iOS did that. You can only use one application. And you know, if you think about uh, what these tablets in earlier uh, generations did, uh, you only use one app, right? Um, you don't work processing or you're taking a photo or what have you. Only recently now, uh, or later, closer to now, uh, as the processors have gotten more, uh, more powerful, you can now run multiple applications at the same time. <coughs> and skips and you can do all sorts of fun stuff like that. But in the early versions, you can only run, uh, run one processor behind, and all of those processes in the background were suspended. And it didn't matter because you know, you were being productive with using the application that you wanted to use, and it didn't really matter uh, so much. And so also, uh, the, uh, to the screen real estate, since it's a much physically smaller screen than having a 21 inch or 30 inch monitor, uh, you will also run into one application and the user interface is a little bit different. So in that particular uh, operating regime, you had a single foreground uh, process. Right? Foreground meaning that it's running interacting with the user, and that was what had the user interface, and that was what you experience as a human environment when you're interacting with your tablet. 
And so this foreground uh, process was controlled through the user interface, and that's how you interact with you in the switch. Uh, many places that cause certain functions uh, in this process uh, to occur. And then also in this operating regime had multiple background processes. Uh, they would be in memory, but not associated with the display. And moreover, um, these things had limits, right? And so most of the computation uh, in those earlier days was really the foreground process because that's what was the task at hand uh, that you wanted to perform. And so some of these limits and these varied uh, on the operating systems and they changed over time and included um, single short tasks got notification and so rather than running proactively you were notified okay go ahead and do something go ahead and do something go ahead and do something right and that was all uh, for the purpose of preserving CPU uh, as well as making sure that from a user experience standpoint um, you're not going to be upset that the code that you're using is responsive, i.e. it has a lot of process of time, but you um, won't really care so much um, if a process in the background you're not interacting with this thing. And so that was on purpose, and it was a way to present the illusion that this thing had a lot more power uh, than it really did. Okay. Any questions about this? Make sense? So certainly, this is just a nod to the fact that even though you know in operating systems you talk about uh, general design principles, uh, things change certainly when you're engineering artifact on which you for which you design the system. You know, artifact underlying the changes. Right. Uh, so, for example, if you're uh, designing a car, well, it's a different car if you had maybe uh, a 400 horsepower engine versus if you have a 110 horsepower engine. Right, the underlying power plant is different, so the system itself on uh, top of that has to, has to change. Okay, so Android. So let's take a brief look at Android. It runs in the foreground and the background, uh, and it has fewer limits. The background processes use services, right? Uh, they don't interact with the UI, and any um, thing that it wants to perform is done by connecting to a service. Now that service might be an actual service running in memory, uh, like you would interact with a web server, or it could be some API uh, that puts into a uh, runtime someplace. Uh, that service can keep running even if the background process is suspended. So you might have a service that's going to interact with the disk, a service that's going to interact with the memory. And that's a nice way of striking balance because these sort of operations associated with kernel uh, can continue to run in a small memory environment, but you don't have the whole application there um, occupying the RAM and fractional use uh, of the CPU. And so these services have no user interface. And whether you know it or not, a user interface is a very memory intensive thing and a very computation intensive thing. If you think about it, all of those pixels on your screen are constantly being redrawn, redrawn, redrawn a few times a second. And that gives you the reason, particularly in, in uh, uh, operations like dragging something across the screen. Right? So every time you drag something across the screen, it's those mouse movement uh, signals that have to be read by the operating system. And then it interprets that signal and based on the direction associated with that mouse movement, it has to redraw the screen a few times a second. And you see it as strong, but to the underlying operating system, it's a lot of calculation uh, of uh, polygons and shapes, and then it's the updating of the location of those shapes. And then it's a lot of I.O. and taking all those pixel values and sending them out through uh, the display controller, ultimately to the uh, visual visualization the monitor or, or the screen on the, on the tablet. Yeah. And it even gets worse if you have a touch screen, right? Uh, because with the mouse, it's a simple mouse click the peripheral, but with a touch screen, you're now reading gestures, you're looking at dynamic information. And so there's a lot of stuff going on when you interact with the user interface. And so for a lot of these mobile devices that have interesting uh, user interfaces, uh, they devote a lot of uh, CPU time and CPU effort, as it were, uh, to the maintenance and management of those things. And so these services have no user interface, and because they have no user interface, it's a big savings anytime some application wants to use it, especially if it's running in the background. Uh, it doesn't give a big burden on the system for um, drawing, to draw yet one more uh, program's uh, user interface. Any questions about this? Make sense? So, a context switch. Context switch is the name ascribed to the switching uh, from one uh, by the CPU 
from one process to the next. Now, we've been talking more generally about context switch as you know, this analogous uh, process control block, or PCB, and this process control block, as you said, is a C structure on a struct, uh, and it's the uh, taking of the CPU state, all the information uh, on the CPU associated with the process. So that would be the register file, it would be uh, the memory pointers, the stack pointer, the program counter, uh, and it would also be the register file values, bless you. And so it takes all of that, populates a PCB uh, structure with that information, uh, and that is the um, saving of state, or context as it were, uh, as it's called, for that particular process. And so when you're switching context, that's the process of uh, saving off one process's PCB information, and then taking another process's PCB information and populating the CPU with that. You're switching your execution context from one process to another. And so when the CPU switches to another process, it has to save the state of the old process and load the state from the new process. And this part is called, this procedure is called a context switch. And so the context is uh, depicted or measured or stored as the PCB. Now, the neat part about it is that you can store that in memory, but you can also write that out to disk and have it on disk uh, when you're doing this uh, swapping process. Okay. So, context switch, as you can imagine, there's a large overhead, right? It takes time to context switch. Granted, it's not seconds, but it's non zero amount of time. And especially when your context switch involves writing something out to disk, it's even more time. And so it's really, really important uh, if you're going to tinker with an operating system to make the context switch fast. Because if you're, say, scheduling uh, 10 processes a second, right, uh, that means 10 times a second uh, you're going to have to do a context switch. So it's really, really important that you get this process fast, which also means you don't add to the size of the process control block unnecessarily. Right? That's a big no-no. Right? Uh, so context switch is overhead. And the system, when you're doing context switching, nothing is happening. So that moment when it's saving the CPU to a PCB and then taking a different PCB process control block and putting that on the CPU, nothing is happening on the system. So that's why you want to minimize the amount of time that it takes for your system to do a context switch. Because if you don't, well, you're now throwing away uh, that time on the CPU. And it doesn't matter how fast your processor is. If your context switch is slow, um, your throughput on your uh, CPU, on your system, is also going to be very slow. And so the more complex the operating system, and also the more complex the PCB, i.e. the PCB struct has more information in it, certainly that time is going to take longer, which means you basically have your system sitting idle, doing nothing, i.e. not accomplishing work, but it's doing this context switch. Now certainly you as the user, right, you're not going to say, oh gosh, well the context switch is taking a really long time. What you're going to say is this computer is slow. So you're going to blame uh, the hardware or maybe the operating system if you're savvy like yourself, um, but you're not going to think about the context switch. Okay. And so it's time dependent on hardware support. And there is specialized hardware uh, on most modern systems uh, to support these context switches to try to get them to be fast. If you can uh, burn something in the CPU uh, or do anything in hardware to assist some operation software, it's going to be faster just by the sheer nature that hardware execution is very fast. And so some hardware supports this by having multiple sets of registers. You have more than one copy. And so if you have more than one copy, while one is involved, one copy is involved in a context switch, the other can be um, loading another one and not waiting and go forward. So if one is working while the other is context switching. And then the other that's context uh, was working, now it context switch while the other one is working. And so uh, some uh, CPUs maintain uh, more than one set of registers uh, so that uh, one is context switching while one is actually executing to kind of make sure that the CPU is as active as possible and not pausing to copy on and off uh, these PCB uh, struct uh, information for each process. Uh, any questions about this? Make sense? Okay. So <clears throat> let's take a look at operations and processes. And so the system has to provide mechanisms uh, for process creation, uh, process execution, uh, and process termination. Right? So let's take a look at some of that in, in more detail. 
And so when you create a process, the first question is, where does the process come from? Well, a process is created by an executing program. And we just said uh, an executing program is a process. So processes create other processes. And there's a very first process that started by your system called the init process. And the init process is the one that is the starting place, the root of all of this process uh, creation. And so a so-called parent process uh, creates a so-called child process. If you call this uh, uh, system call uh, to create process, and we'll talk about that in a slide or two. Uh, so parent process creates a child process, and that child process can now create other child processes, right? And so if you think about this relationship, um, you can get this tree, almost like uh, an ancestry tree, right? You have this first uh, process, and it created children, and each of those created children, and those can create children, and so forth. And so you get this tree of processes, and each process has to be identified uh, to the operating system. More correctly, the PCB associated with each process has to be identified by the operating system. And so this identification is a number, and that number is a so-called process identifier. And in some systems, the process ID, or PID, represents the index into that table uh, or list of PCB strikes, right? And so the process ID is the system's way of knowing which process you are. Now, of course, if you create a process, you need to know who are your child processes. And therefore, if you look at the units PCB and we brought up uh, that web page last time, you'll see an entry, uh, which is a pointer uh, to uh, uh, the task struct, which is the PCB structure in Linux. Uh, and that is a list of all your child processes. Right? Uh, so process identifier is how you identify in the system each process instance, whether it's a parent process or a child process. Uh, and you can share resources. Now, this relationship uh, between parent process and child process can either be completely decoupled from one another, they can share some resources, or they can share all of their resources. And it's up to you to decide what that is, and there's reasons why you might do that, uh, one uh, of these choices. And so a parent and child can share all your resources. So this is where you want multiple units of execution, right, and schedulability uh, by the short-term scheduler on your operating system. And these things might share the same file system or share the same network connection and so forth. Right? Well, so let's say you write a network program and you want to be able to service as a server uh, more than one incoming connection. Because right? certainly in most websites you can have more than one user accessing it. Well, you might want a single process and later when we learn about threads, you know, that's the quote unquote right way to do it. But you might want more than one unit of execution on the CPU handling each client request. So that's one of the reasons why you might have a parent process and child process share the same resources, because you're using the child process instances uh, to service incoming requests, for example. Or let's say you're accessing a bunch of different files, and you want to, say, load a bunch of JPEGs and display it on a web page. Well, you might want to maintain more than one connection uh, to load each one of these JPEGs across the internet. Uh, so there's another case where a child shares only a subset of the parent's resources. Now, you share a subset instead of the entire set of resources because maybe you want that of those uh, resources that you're not sharing to be protected uh, from the child process, but you want some of them uh, to be shared because you want to increase some degree of parallelism, uh, as it were. Uh, and then, of course, parent and child can share no resources. The parent is just spawning some other unit of execution, and this thing is going to go off merrily on its own and do its own thing, right? Uh, so if you look at what happens on the command line interface, the command line interface is a parent process. You type a command and hit enter. Well, that command line interface is invoking as a child process the program uh, that whose name you specify. And when you hit enter, it goes off and does its own thing, different from the parent, not sharing any of its resources, and then it exits. Now, of course, when the child uh, exits, uh, the parent process that created it has to wait for it. And what wait is, uh, is the blocking and the, uh, the reception of what's called the termination status. Uh, in C, when you have a main routine, right, and we talked about the main routine as being uh, the thing that's called when you run the program, uh, you recall that the main routine in terms of integer. It was int main was the function signature. And that integer type, that main routine returns, that's the status code. 
Now, we haven't really been using it at this juncture, uh, but the status code, if the value is zero, it means there's no error. And if the value is greater than zero, it means there are certain types of errors. So this return value for the main key means something, and it means something to the parent process that created it. Now, of course, when you're running, um, the init process, you usually don't get to see. That's underneath the covers of the operating system. But eventually, you get the command line interface or the system uh, program loader. And when you double click on something or you type something on the command line, hit enter, um, the whole reason why that program runs is because a parent process called that program uh, that, or started a process, a child process, which was the program that you specified. So when you execute uh, a process, uh, the parent can execute concurrently with the child, or the parent can wait until the child terminates. When you execute concurrently, as the name or description implies, you're both merrily running along uh, doing something at the same time. Now, of course, it's not really at the same time. You're each getting fractional usage of the CPU off the ready queue through the short-term scheduler. So the short-term scheduler takes the child process from the ready queue, gives it a fraction of time, it kicks it off, back into the ready queue, then the parent process gets a fraction of time, and then the child process gets a fraction of time, the parent process, and so on, right? And so what you see as running at the same time, they're not really running at the same time, they're just sharing this CPU resource one fraction of a second uh, at a time each, and the scheduler is selecting among them to give them fractional usage, one after the other after the other. Okay, uh, so you can execute concurrently, uh, or the illusion of concurrency, or the parent can just wait for the child. Now when you wait, you're not really executing your block, right? You're not making any progress. But what this wait uh, condition is, is that the parent created the child, and it then says, okay, I'm done executing, but my child isn't done executing. So I'm going to halt my continuation until I hear back from that child. Now, of course, uh, hearing back from that child is done through its exit status for its main routine, right? Uh, and so this parent waiting for the child is waiting for that child to terminate, to call exit uh, from its execution, meaning that it's going to restore, the operating system is going to restore all of its resources back for use by some other process, right? back to use by some other process. Uh, and the parent can now continue with its exit. And so Parent waiting until the child terminates means that the parent will halt until it knows that the child is done. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Make sense? <clears throat> okay, so this is a depiction of some of the processes, and I stress some, because it's certainly not all the processes in a typical uh, Linux system. And you start out with the init process. And one thing you'll notice, uh, the process ID or PID of the init process is one, right? It's the first process that's created in your system. And the init process is responsible for uh, creating all of the other processes in the system, whether directly uh, or indirectly. And so here you have at the top the init process, uh, and it calls kthread uh, process, kthread D, or to D stands for daemon. Uh, daemon is a type of process that runs in the background, does not have a user interface. And this kthread D is responsible uh, for loading all of the threads. Okay. And so it also starts the login process and SSHD, secure shell daemon, right? Um, secure shell is a way of remotely logging into another machine. Right, so it starts a bunch of other processes, and those processes start other processes. So for example, the login process starts bash. Uh, bash stands for born again shell, right? Uh, it's a, a, a type of command line interface, and there are several command line interfaces that have uh, clever names. Uh, but this bash uh, command line shell then allows you to type in the name of a command, and then once uh, you type in that name of the command to bash, uh, bash then executes that. Uh, as a child process. And so Emacs is a word processor uh, on Unix's. PS uh, is a command on uh, Unix uh, and Linux uh, that says show me a list of all the processes on your system. And so as you can see, every process can create child processes. And if you take uh, all of these processes uh, together uh, and you plot or depict the parent-child relationship uh, with an edge, you get a tree structured graph. Okay. Any questions about this? Make sense? Okay, so at some point in the future after the exam, 
um, we will have an assignment and see uh, we will actually get some experience on, uh, in Unix environment, uh, POSIX in particular, in creating processes. So let's take a look at the address space. The address space is what is referred to as all of the RAM that is owned by your program in its executable state. And so when you have the address space, we've talked about this layout of memory of process. We had the text section, right? We had the data section, which had your uh, uh, global variables. Uh, we had the heap, which uh, was a section of memory that contained all of your allocated memory. And then we had the stack, was uh, this other section of memory uh, that was uh, allocated, but it was indirectly uh, through function calls, through that local variables or parameters to your functions. And so all of that collectively is a so-called address space. And when you create a child, when you process, create a child process, that child in the beginning is a precise copy of the parent. So that means if you have one version of the address space, you're now gonna get an exact duplicate uh, in that. Right? And so um, this command in C on units is called fork. Right? So when you fork a process, um, you create an exact duplicate, and each of these duplicates is now running. Right? You have two exact uh, PCBs, and these PCBs, the original and the duplicate, which has all the same values in the beginning, uh, are both schedulable uh, on the ready queue and can each have fractional time on the CPU. So, the first thing that happens is that, okay, a parent forks a child, so you get an exact duplicate and a copy of the PCB, and then the child copy says, okay, well, I'm going to execute a different program. And that execution of a different program then loads a different set of binaries off the disk, and therefore, uh, the PCB is going to change to them. Okay? And that executing of the program is called exec. Uh, that's the C function uh, in the Unix uh, POSIX environment. And so what happens is the parent comes along and it's depicted in the schematic, and this is in the book, and the parent calls fork. And when you call fork, one copy is the child and the other copy uh, is the parent. So then the child copy calls exec, and that exec loads the new binaries off disk into that copy associated uh, with uh, the child. And that's still the child process, only it is chosen now to load a different binary, uh, so it's a different program running. So now, the child is executing in this section, the parent continues to execute, and then the child called exit. Now, before the child called exit, the parent, the first thing it did, you know, it ran along, did, doing some stuff, it said, I'm gonna wait for my child to finish executing. Because I created the child, I'm responsible for this child's exit as well. Okay, so the parent then executes while the child is executing, and the child is called a different program to execute, and the parent then before it, uh, you know, whenever it can, typically it's before the parent exits, it calls wait. So now the parent blocks. It does not further execute until it gets that exit status from the child. So then the child is executing, 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 it's done executing, it calls exit, and it does so by returning from the main routine some integer uh, from zero or greater than zero. And so it calls exit, the parent gets that information, it knows the status of the child, and then the parent can either resume or it can exit uh, itself. Any questions about this? So the first time you actually do this, you're like, wow, okay. So this is how they do that. Uh, yeah, it's a lot simpler than it might seem. And so we'll end, I think, here. I had originally budgeted uh, for more questions. I um, can't remember what's on the next slide. Okay, that's the Windows version, okay. So this is uh, what a fork and exact looks like in the C programming language. And so like any C program, we include our uh, header files to pull in the definitions of various system calls that we need in order to do this. In this case, we're gonna uh, call uh, input sys-types. Sys is a directory, types.h is a header file, so we have a number sign include for that. We also have a number sign include for standard I.O. because we're gonna do some printouts. And then we have a number sign include for UNI, uh, Unix uh, as standard uh, .h, right? And that brings in some other definitions which we'll talk about next time when we actually do this interactively uh, on the command line in a future class after the exam. So we have our main routine. In this case, main does not have an RC and an RV, but it still returns an integer. So we have this PID underscore T, that's a struct that's defined in one of these header files, and we call it PID for process ID. 
So now you see why these structs are very important. They use structs all over the place in operating systems for bookkeeping, for all sorts of things. And so the parent calls fork. Now when you call fork, you're going to get, when fork returns, an exact copy. You can think of fork inside the operating system if you were to think of what the implementation of the system call is in the OS runtime. It says, make a copy of my PCB. Now, if you make a copy of the PCB, it looks like two exact copies of the same program. But remember, when I say two exact copies, it's up to you whether you choose to have them share resources or not. Let's make the assumption that they do not share resources. So if you have two exact copies, they're going to have different stacks that point to different reasons of uh, memory. They can have different heaps. They can have different data sections and different text sections. You can absolutely share those if you want to. But let's just make the simplifying assumption for now that you're going to have differences. And so any program, when we talked about the layout, a program is laid out as what's called relocatable. Right? Everything is, um, when you, if you actually look at the documentation and the level doc for the stuff, it talks about here's the beginning and what's the offset from that beginning. And the reason why they talk about the layout of a, of a process in memory that way is because that beginning can be moved around someplace. You can sit in one place in RAM or sit in another place in RAM. So when you do this fork, you can think of it as duplicate the PCB. Now when you duplicate the PCB, well, one PCB is going to refer to a layout in this part of memory, and the other is going to refer to a layout in this part of memory, but the contents will be exactly the same in the beginning. So when this fork returns, you're now going to have two instances of this program running, right? And that's the kind of hard part to wrap your mind around when you first see this. When this returns, now imagine having a second copy of this code executing, and they're both going to have execution at the program counter, right? The program counter, as we said, talks about the net location uh, or the offset uh, of the next executable instruction. So after this fork, the next executable instruction is going to be assigned to a variable called PID. And PID is PIDT um, underscore T uh, PID, right? The local variable. So now, you can have two copies when fork returns. So imagine this thing duplicated again. And if you were in a debugger environment, you have the cursor pointing here on the first copy and the cursor pointing there on the second copy. So now, two things are going to happen. Well, this is going to return from fork and assign to PID. And the copy is going to return from fork and assign to PID. One of them will be the parent, the original, and the other is going to be the child. That's the copy. So PID is going to have two different values. Well, if PID is equal to zero, that return from fork, that corresponds uh, to the child process. If PID is greater than zero, well, that corresponds to the parent process. If PID is less than zero, that means that there's a problem with fork, right? Maybe there weren't enough resources to start a child process. So we call fork, we get an exact copy of the code executing, and literally that's what happens uh, if you have two different text sections of your program. One copy will have the original PID that's returned is greater than zero, so its execution is going to jump down here, right? If the, the, the copy, its PID that's returned from fork is going to be um, equal to zero, so its execution is going to jump down here in the copy, right? So then the parent is executing here. And in this code, the parent waits for the child, right? Um, and the child, its execution jumps down here, right, in the child copy, and it's going to exec. What's it going to exec? It's going to execute this bin ls, so ls is another program on disk, and it's going to run that program. Make sense? So then the child calls this exec, the ls runs, and then exits, and then the child exits, returns zero and it's done. The parent that is waiting, well, the child returned and exited with a return value of zero, so it unblocks from the wait, it's no longer waiting when the child exits, and now prints the child is complete. Okay. And so you can think of this fork as inside the OS, copy the PCB, and now I have two exact copies running, and you're gonna think about it as a C program. Imagine now I have another copy of the C program, and then execution resumes, only for the parent process, the return value from fork is going to be greater than zero, but for the child copy, uh, the return value from fork is going to be equal to zero. 
Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Yes. What um what stops the what breaks the weight? Is that weight no? Ah, uh, yes. Know. The exiting of the child process breaks the weight. Uh, it's a so-called blocking call, meaning that when you call it, the parent stops. They can't execute, uh, go past this. And what unblocks it is the child copy returning returning some number, returning from its execution. Now, if the child, for some strange reason, let's say the child is in an infinite loop, then the parent will just block, right? Um, you can have a parent, and we, we won't talk about that now, but maybe we'll talk about it another time, send what's called, called a signal to the child to actually have the OS terminate the child. Likewise, some operating systems, when you terminate a parent process, some operating systems will now walk down the tree and terminate all the child processes that emanate from it. So if we were to terminate this process, some, not all, some operating systems say, if I terminate this process, I'm gonna look at it, I'm gonna traverse that list of child processes. I'm gonna terminate this child. Well, this child created two children. I'm gonna terminate that one, terminate that one, that terminate this one, and then go ahead and finish the termination. So the operating systems, some operating systems do have protections uh, for what's called orphan processes, uh, but at this juncture, from the programmatic standpoint, um, what unblocks this weight uh, is the exiting of the child copy. Okay, all right. Any other questions? No? All right, and so this is the Windows version, and I won't talk too much about it, but here, you'll notice all the work is done in the create process call, right? There's a lot of stuff going on here, uh, but they uh, allocate what looks like a process, a struct process. It's different in Windows, uh, but they allocate any structure, they zero it out uh, using zero memory instead of memset, um, because memset is a Unix thing. And then here, create process. Now in create process, you notice here, they have the path to an executable, a .exe file. So in Windows, the one call is doing the fork and exec at the same time, right? But it's still the same stuff that goes on underneath the cover. You copy the PCB, and then one copy will do the program. And then the parent copy waits for that child to exit. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? No? All right. So with that, um, uh, we'll end. No, actually, not. let me finish this one thought. Uh, process termination. So in addition to returning from the main routine, as you can see in the C program here, when the child copy returns and um, gives some error code, uh, that will unblock uh, the parent process. But let's say you know you didn't have it finish the main routine, you wanted to terminate somewhere in your code. Uh, there's also a system call called exit. So not only return from the main routine, but also exit. Uh, we'll do it too. And in exit, if you do a manual page on exit or Google search it, exit will take a parameter uh, of an integer, and it's that same integer which is uh, returned back to the parent process uh, when it waits for the child, right? So not only does return from the main, but also calling exit anywhere in the program uh, will turn to the child process, okay? All right, uh, so a process can terminate the execution of children. Right, uh, and there's a function called the abort function, and when a parent um, calls the abort function, it specifies the process ID of the child. Right, you'll note from the C program when it created the child process, um, it knew what the process ID was. Right, and so a parent can say, okay, let me call the abort function, and I just want to terminate um, uh, the child process. So. Uh, not only can a parent process, <laughs> you know, I brought you into this world, they can kick you out, right? That's <laughs> what parents sometimes say. Well, the same thing goes for processes uh, at the programmatic interface. So a parent can bring a child process into this world, and they can take the child process out of this world. All right, anyways, or the CPU world, whatever analogy you want to use. And so um, why might this happen? Um, maybe the child process has taken up more resources uh, than it should. Uh, maybe um, you know the child has performed some task and it's no longer needed by the parent. Uh, maybe um, the parent is exiting, and so it says, "All right, I'm going to exit, so I'm going to proactively um, terminate all the child processes versus rely on the operating system doing it for them." Okay. Uh, so there are many reasons from a process standpoint why you, why you might want to call the uh, abort uh, routine. Okay, and so. Um, uh, some operating systems uh, will do this for you, right? As I said before, uh, you can't make the assumption that it will, 
Um, typically, when you have these general purpose desktop operating systems or laptop, you know, uh, they implement things like that, but you can't assume, especially for the mobile environment, that this is the case. Uh, so uh, it's called cascading termination, and it's a convenience for you. Uh, but if you're going to assume, I mean, certainly look it up in your OS documentation and don't just assume. Uh, so we'll end there. Uh, if you know the questions, um, and I will see you all on Thursday. Uh, good luck, and I look forward uh, for any questions that you might have about the exam.